Hi, welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. You are in for a treat. I know how busy everyone is and I'm welcome you to uh, our last CAPES um, webinar on does changing health behaviors help your arthritis, lifestyle, myths, and solutions. This is your chance to really sit back, relax. You're gonna hear from patients and physicians uh, about a very interesting topic. So please remember to uh, put any questions you have in the chat for us. We'd be happy to answer it in our live Q&A. Um, this will be an educational uh, series on uh, wellness or educational webinar, I should say, on wellness um, through an education grant through Pfizer with a joint participation between Spartan, Grappa, the SAA, as well as the National Psoriasis Foundation. Um, next slide. So just to orient you, uh, we will uh, our agenda uh, will include a, a patient perspective. So you will be hearing about Brian's story and Brandon's story. And then we're going to go into a nice uh, lecture on the immunologic basis of wellness for spondyloarthritis patients and why we want it um, with Dr. Len Calabris uh, from the Cleveland Clinic. And then we're going to end with a panel discussion where we are going to answer questions just from you, from you, the audience. We're so glad that you're here um, joining us. Next slide. So as we begin, we wanted to start with the patient perspective. So we wanted to better understand how lifestyle modifications may have affected um, patients that, you know, just like you have either spondyloarthritis or psoriatic arthritis. So I really want to bring a warm welcome to uh, Brian LaFoy and Brandon Robert. Um, and I'm going to have each of them um, share their perspective um, with you. So uh, next slide, or we will have uh, Brandon start. Or Brian, sorry. <laughs> I think I'm supposed to start Dr. Husney, so I'll go ahead and begin. Awesome, thank you, Brian. Hello everyone, my name's Brian LaFoy and I have psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. I've lived with these diseases for most of my adult life. I'm 52 now and was diagnosed with psoriasis in my early 20s and psoriatic arthritis in my 30s. And my journey with psoriatic arthritis started over 15 years ago. And something that has always been very important to me and has played a huge role in my mental and physical well-being is, is my lifestyle. And I've played competitive sports and pursued extreme sports my entire life and still do today. And right now I play ice hockey several times a week. I play indoor soccer. I surf several times a year. I snowboard and I coach most of my kids' sports. So I stay very, very active. But one day about 15 years ago, my right hand and fingers started to hurt almost overnight. And not just hurt, but the slightest touch would nearly drop me to the floor in pain. And I played a lot of indoor soccer at the time and ice hockey. So being hurt was not anything unusual to me. So I didn't think a lot of it. Having aches and pains all over was just normal. But this particular pain intensified over the period of just a few days to the point where it was debilitating. And I couldn't perform basic daily functions like opening the refrigerator, driving, typing for work. And I certainly couldn't play sports. So I was I was puzzled, but I still didn't think much of it. I went to the doctor thinking something was just broken or sprained, but all my x-rays and exams came back negative. And since the doctors couldn't diagnose what was wrong, they decided to perform exploratory surgery on me. And they opened up my hand along my index finger all the way into my palm. And even after that surgery, I still had no diagnosis. I still had the pain. And so the doctors put me on some terrible antibiotics with some just awful side effects, thinking that I had some kind of bacteria um, inside my hand. I couldn't handle the side effects, so I just, I stopped taking them. And I said, this is ridiculous. I can't do this anymore. And I felt like I was pretty much out of options, but I was not going to give up. So I needed to figure out what was happening because it was still impacting my ability to work and play sports. And honestly, what probably drove me the most was not being able to play sports. So just through a lot of my own research, um, I finally diagnosed myself. And so I took my, di my diagnosis to my dermatologist at the time who was already treating my psoriasis. And he confirmed immediately that I was right and I had psoriatic arthritis. 
And so I felt really stupid at the time because I'd been around this disease my entire life. My dad has it, but it just never occurred to me that that's what this was. And so initially medicine was the answer and being on a biologic medication helped me return at least to the quality of life I wanted, but I still lived in pain every day. It was just more tolerable. And I've since had many other joints impacted. So I began to explore other lifestyle changes to supplement the benefits of what that medication has done. So because psoriatic disease impacts everybody differently and even responses to treatment, whether through medication or natural relief measures can vary, it's definitely a trial and error process to find out what works. And so some of the methods I've explored that I'm sure we'll discuss later in this discussion um, in number one is maintaining my activity level because that's such a huge part of my happiness and well-being, as I mentioned, and just keeping my body active and healthy. Number two is I've, I've changed my diet, not necessarily going on diets or, or dieting, quote unquote, but changing what I put in my body and making healthier choices. Getting more sleep is another one. I went a lot of years on not very much sleep. And what I've found over the years is I can make it through the day fine, but psoriatic arthritis just wears you down. It just does. And so I try to ignore it during the day or when I'm doing things that are fun or active, spending time with my family or playing sports, but it hits me pretty hard at night. And so what that means to me is it's, it's more important for me to try to get enough sleep at night to let my body heal and, and take on the next day. And finally, just keeping my stress levels down. I think that's, that's been a big trigger for me. And mostly that comes from being able to maintain my activity level. And now that I have kids, that's a big help as well, because I love spending time with them and doing things with them. So I'm fortunate to have a really good support group with my family and friends. And I've had a great doctor who's helped me manage this disease. And I also believe that God's blessed me with this condition now to put me in a position to help others. So I've become a patient advocate, not only to help others with my story, but also to hopefully make a difference in finding a, a cure during my lifetime by partnering with doctors and researchers and, and other patients. And my hope, my hope is ultimately to someday have a cure. But in the meantime, I just try to find lifestyle solutions that allow me to continue the quality of life that I want. And I hope to do that someday naturally without having to have any medication. I'm also a third generation psoriasis patient. So I feel it's my job as a father now to do everything I can for my children and equip them with the tools and practices I've learned in the event that they someday have to face this. So thank you for your time today and being with us and listening to our stories. And I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Brian. That was a really nice uh, summary synopsis. And I think resonates probably with many people on this uh, call. And now I'd love to hear from Brandon and hear his story and his perspective as well. Hey, uh, Dr. Husney, thank you. And uh, thank you everyone for having me on. Um, I'm looking forward to, to the Q&A after this and, and kind of sharing uh, my journey through ankylosing spondylitis. Um, I was diagnosed with it probably uh, six years ago now, um, but suffered from problems with it since probably my early 20s, um, although I didn't know what it was. Um, and I'm, I'm a lot like Brian. I've always done a lot of um, sports where injuries are pretty common. Um, a lot of snowboarding, a lot of wakeboarding, uh, skateboarding. And so anytime I would get hurt, I, or like my back would hurt, I would just kind of, it, it was always associated with um, like something I was doing with the sports. And so I just kind of, oh, you know, I just think everyone feels like this. And then, um, you know, my, my first time where I experienced what it, what it feels like to not be able to walk, I think I was like 19 years old, maybe 20 years old. Um, and, and so I just kind of, oh, I, you know, I was riding my bike at the time. So I just thought maybe that's what it's from, um, which is pretty common for people with AS. I think they kind of go, go through their life without ever being diagnosed until later in life. Um, and so if you fast forward to, you know, six years ago, I was training for a triathlon and I got done and I just couldn't walk. Um, and it's very immediate. Um, like just, you just cannot move. Um, so I decided, okay, I'm going to go to the doctor. I'm going to find out what's wrong. And, um, so I 
went and saw a fantastic doctor. They did a um, arthritis panel um, with my blood and they found um, the antigen in there that can that says you can have arthritis. And then with my symptoms, they sent me to a rheumatologist who told me that I have ankylosing spondylitis. So, it, you know, knowledge is power. I was, I was I said, OK, now I know what's wrong with me. Now I can learn a little bit about it. And, you know, I left that doctor's office and uh, one life ended and a new life began. And that is when, um, you know, I, I needed to accept some things. And, you know, I always say accept, adapt and overcome. And that's what um, I, I think you have to do to stay ahead of diseases like this. Um, or, or else, like Brian said, they'll just beat you down just day in and day out. They will just beat you down to nothing. So my life has become um, just this one giant mission to see how far I can go. Um, so right now I'm training for a two, uh, 250 mile run in Arizona uh, in May. It's called the Cocodona 250. Um so that's what I'm working towards right now. And I've done several Ironman events and, and a lot of ultra running stuff. And it's all just in an effort to see how far I can go. But through these, these years of trial and error, I've also realized that um, the further I go, the better I feel. So I want to, to move. Movement to me is just as important as the medication. Um, and, and the other things, how you can treat these diseases. I think movement is just as important. And I, I think Brian touched on this too. For me, um, I do this for my son because it's a genetic disease. And, I, you know, if it does come to that one day, then he'll, I'll be, I'll be able to tell him, you know, look at what I, look at what I have done. Um, you know, you can do this and more you know, I feel like it's my kind of duty to pave the way for him, do the trial in the air, do the hard work. And then if it comes to that, I can just say, you know, here's what we're going to do. Um, so that's, ba that's basically my mission right now and what keeps my fire burning. And so with that, I think I'll wrap it up. Thank you, Brandon. Another nice, inspiring, articulate story of, um, and thank you so much for sharing openly and candidly um, about how this disease has affected you and what you've done um, to, to help you along the ways. I think this is really helpful for other people to hear. Um, next, we want to change our gears a little bit and uh, have a, listen to a presentation um, on some of the immunologic basis um, for wellness and what we have learned to date and what we know about how lifestyle, uh, you know, habits um, can really help um, somebody with a chronic disease. So I'm really um, excited to welcome Dr. Len Calabrese. He's a friend and a colleague um, at the Cleveland Clinic with me in the Department of Rheumatology. And we talk uh, a lot about these topics um, both from just our own perspectives, our patients, um, and sharing stories of how we can really, you know, get this more in the mainstream to really help people who are dealing with chronic illnesses. So I think you'll really enjoy this presentation. And just once again, to remind you that we do have an open chat box. So if there is any questions um, that come up along the way, please feel free to just add them in the chat and we will collate them and we'll come back as a panel to help answer all your questions. And no questions are ever too, too small um, or too big. Um, we, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and you, know, you have uh, such great uh, people on the panel today that have been dealing with these diseases. It'd be great to have a discussion um, around this topic with the panelists. Thanks. Well, I'm really happy to be here to talk about the immunologic basis of wellness for spondyloarthritis patients and to really tell you why we want it. So I'm going to break this down into a number of stanzas. I'm going to talk about, you know, why the treatments we have for spa right now are great, but not enough. What is wellness and why do we want it? 
And then the power of our behavior, diet, exercise, mindfulness, and I'll throw in a little bit about sleep. Now, finally, I'll talk about something called immune strength because we're excited about it. So this is a shout out to the Spondyloarthritis Association of America. Um, done a fantastic job supporting patients with SPA. And I think I have mentioned uh, this during this um, conference uh, that I have non-radiographic axial SPA and I've had it since I was a young person and I've been in remission for a long time from it, but it's come and gone over my life and I, and I understand it uh, 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 intimately. In this monograph, uh, there is a list of the medications that, ranging from the non-steroidals to the biologics, and that these are growing by the day. And only in the past uh, few days have been a, a, a new approval of uh, patacitinib for non-radiographic axial spa. So uh, a lot of things are, are coming along right now. So what has this meant to patients with spa to have all of these therapies uh, available? Well, let's raise the bar. And, you know, we know that these medicines have the capacity to reduce inflammation around the spine and um, uh, uh, slow or retard radiographic progression and improve quality of life. Um, you know, we're looking for all of those things to do um, even better things, you know, to improve our ability to work and play and be social. Um, and uh, certainly um, uh, uh, one of the major roadblocks uh, are costs of therapy, access to therapy and beyond. Even when people have achieved uh, a, a slowing or retarding of disease activity, um, there are other things that are of concern. Now, this is a, 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 a slide um, by Dr. Bingham from Johns Hopkins, and it talks about rheumatoid arthritis, but it would equally apply to spa. And what we're looking at here is on the left, um, those uh, are domains in the disease that are prioritized by practitioners, physicians and advanced practitioners. And there, those are the objective things. What are your labs? What are the x-rays? You know, what is the, uh, the level of pain on this uh, analog score? And on the right, those are things when we talk to patients who have inflammatory arthritis, such as SPA, that they prioritize. You know, there's more to it than just uh, pain. It's my ability to socially manage and and participate. Um, uh, my sleep is lousy. Uh, I'm stressed out. I'm fatigued. Um, so while these things are highly related, you know, they are not always the same. These are domains over on the right that patients value that we consider, you know, actually more wellness domains. And of course, there are many that are shared. So what is this wellness thing that we advocate, even in the face of having so many drugs to, to use to treat this disease? Um, what is wellness and how do we get it? Well, wellness has a lot of different definitions. And I think that, you know, at face value, all of us want them. You know, it's more than signs or symptoms and a diagnosis because all illness is personal. Wellness encompasses a diverse uh, number of dimensions, including mind, body, and spirit. And those things aren't measured by your CRP or your, your X-ray or your MRI. I think that uh, it includes personal choices. And that's so important because this is a behavior. <clears throat> and, and we want to achieve that physical vitality, mental alacrity and sharpness, social satisfaction and personal fulfillment. But, you know, in the end of the day, it's kind of like I know it when I see it. And I tell patients, you know, wellness occurs when lives go well. And I think all of us would agree on that. Empowerment. Empowerment is your capacity to actually get it done, to know I can do it and I can achieve this. And, you know, these are things that we say in our head, you know, I can do more. I want a day without this darn fatigue. You know, taking care of myself used to be at the bottom of my list. You know, I just would go about my business, but now I'm all about wellness. 
this is what empowerment is. And this is the first step on the journey to wellness. So let's do a, a little immunology 101. Um, you know, this is our immune system and it should be in perfect balance. The immune system is designed to protect us against danger, whether it's an infection or um, pollution or toxin or, um, uh, uh, or an, a, 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 an inflammatory disease. So we have defenses that we deploy and that is inflammation but it has to be tightly regulated and balanced or that if you get too much inflammation, that'll harm the host. So everything about immune health is about achieving balance. Um, so this notion of a, a finely, highly tuned and uh, tightly regulated immune system, you know, let's ask the question, you know, why does it get goofed up? What, what, are, what are the reasons that we don't have this? Well, everyone says, oh, it's in my genes. You know, I have bad genes. You know, I have, a pay, I have an uncle with ulcerative colitis and, you know, my grandfather has psoriasis or, you know, somebody in my family has spa. Um, the genes are the cards that you're dealt with when you're born. But what I'm going to tell you in the next few minutes, it's how you play the cards that determines how those genes work. But still, they're important. Age is another factor. And we can't do anything about our age, but you know, in COVID-19, older people do much worse with COVID than younger people. It has to do with the aging of the immune system. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other things that are modifiable um, uh, 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 for our immunologic health. You know, what kind of weight do we carry? Um, what level of physical activity uh, do we have? Um, what we eat, how we sleep, how we handle our stress. And all of these things contribute to chronic low-grade inflammation, which are associated with so many diseases ranging from diabetes to cardiometabolic syndromes to heart disease and cerebrovascular disease and, and, and beyond. So we can do it. You know, if you have SPA, you have an immunologic condition. Your behaviors modify your immune system. So let's talk about what are the things that I think can be done and things that I know that can be done to help you achieve this wellness. Okay, there are the domains again, diet, exercise, sleep, and mental and spiritual health. Let's tackle them one at a time and talk about, you know, some of the things that we know. Um, before I go into that and talk about, you know, eating a healthy diet and exercising right and de-stressing. That box I just put up on the bottom are the lifestyle changes that have to happen. You know, it doesn't do any good to go eat a healthy diet and exercise if you're, you know, smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. Um, uh, you know, if you uh, try to eat well, but you have not managed your weight properly, you know, you need to start that long and slow journey um, to stop gaining a pound every year um, and, you know, keeping your weight down or getting towards your ideal body weight. Or in 20 years, you'll be 20 pounds heavier. Um, avoiding poisons, uh, which means, you know, overconsumption of alcohol or use of any type of drugs. Um, oh, this is axiomatic. Everybody gets this. It, it, and, and I just bring it to the surface. So wellness, the, the road to wellness, what does it look like? Well, you know, there's always two roads. Uh, on the left you have, you know, this is easy town. Five minutes, you're going to be well. Or the journey of a thousand miles that begins with a single step. And I think that everyone listening to this, because you're engaged enough that you want to learn this, knows that there is no easy town for this. We wouldn't even be talking about it because everyone would do it. So um, let's start. You know, when you see stuff like this, um, you know, it's no wonder that, you know, everyone is confused. Uh, you know, there are thousands upon thousands of sites on social media and on the Internet that, um, you know, will claim that, you know, drinking water will it will, will help you lose uh, uh, all the weight that you want. You don't have to worry about anything. And, you know, if it sounds too good to be true in wellness, 
It probably is. So let's let's say that's a caveat for every every domain that I'll talk to you about. Very simple. So what is the power of diet in spa and inflammatory disease and autoimmune disease? Well, it's pretty it's pretty good. You know, I would say that the dietary studies that have been done in spa are are um, uh, uh, underrepresented. There's not enough studies in this area. But if we look at other diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, there's tons of studies. Um, and I think that there are lessons to be learned that through eating an anti-inflammatory diet, you can lower inflammation. And, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, you know, the lingo of, of spa, and you know that, you know, these biomarkers in your blood, your doctor will be measuring CRP on you because that's a very important biomarker. You can lower your CRP with an anti-inflammatory diet. And there's not one diet that'll do it. You know, the diet in the world goes from over here on the right, which is the Western diet, the standard American diet. We call that the sad diet because it's sad. You know, a lot of refined foods, artificial foods, fried foods, unhealthy fats. And down here on the left are the prudent diets. And that includes things like, yeah, being a vegan, which is really tough, but being an almost vegan, a vegetarian. You know, I eat a diet called VB6. I'm a vegetarian before six o'clock. And after six, I'll selectively eat uh, my protein. Sometimes it's meat, sometimes it's fish, sometimes it's another vegetable. Um, paleo uh, or mixing uh, uh, paleo and veg uh, that my friend Dr. Mark Hyman calls the pegan diet. Um, all of them are acceptable. So how do we go about doing that? Well, you know, I'm just giving you the high points, but this is what we say. You know, I'm a Michael Pollan fan. Eat real food, not stuff that comes in some crazy box that is made out of, you know, all this processed foods. Uh, mostly plants. You can eat uh, protein and meat, but on that plate, you know, a quarter of it's your protein and three quarters of it is the rainbow. Roxanne Succo, um, uh, 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 one of the great teachers of, of uh, health and wellness, uh, says, eat the rainbow. Uh, so Mediterranean, vegan, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, all work for you. All right, so that's step one, diet. I've given you a few uh, tips, try my VB6. There's so many great resources and we'll make a monograph available to you at the end that summarizes all of this. Um, what about exercise? Well, exercise and the immune system are tightly interwound and um, uh, there it can affect how our immune system ages. It can affect us acutely or chronically. It can influence diseases and it actually interacts with uh, how we eat. So combining exercise and diet is far more powerful than doing either one alone. And then it gets into some sticky science and we'll, we'll move on from that. So if you went down to the, you know, nitty gritty of this, and I gave you, you know, the graduate course on uh, immunology and exercise, I will tell you that regular exercise is associated with immune health including both our innate immune system, our early warning system, as well as our adaptive immune system, T cells and B cells. And both innate and adaptive immunity is involved in spondyloarthritis uh, pathogenesis. So this has been proven in the laboratory time and time again. But I tell my patients who have autoimmune diseases, there's another huge benefit from regular exercise. And that is, is that there's a clinical uh, benefit and that lowers your risk of respiratory infections. And this has been actually found in the COVID era that people are regular exercises do much better with COVID-19. Um, this is called the J-curve. And over here is uh, the, uh, 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 this is the risk of having a respiratory infection during a cold and flu season. So, you know, this is how our immune system works ordinarily. Um, and it works pretty good. You know, even during a regular season, you're going to get, you know, a few colds. You might get the flu. Uh, in the past two years, if you haven't had COVID, you, you're lucky, but those are all respiratory infections. If you engage in moderate exercise, and that is um, the, my favorite exercise, which is walking, um, 
and I'll give you some guidelines. Um, that lowers your risks of these uh, infections by 40 to 50% during a cold and flu season. And then finally, if you're um, you know, an over-exerciser, an ultra marathon and run across you know, Death Valley, you actually uh, will suppress your immune system. So you wanna be in the sweet spot of modern exercise. You know, there's a lot of different ways of doing it. You know, my, um, uh, in, my, in my monograph, um, uh, we talk about instant recess. And my nurse practitioner, Betsy and I, you know, when we get a break uh, during our patient days together, we say, okay, let's do a loop. And at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, which is a, uh, almost a 200 acre campus, we can go inside, you know, through some corridors and bridges, take a five minute walk, 10 minute walk, 22 minute walk. Um, it's stopping this activity, which is sedentary, sitting in this chair all day. So and getting up and moving around, you know, four or five minutes uh, every hour um, is, is fantastic. And as it turns out, you know, most patients, uh, people on this planet who live to be 100 years old, none of them are, are dedicated runners or go to the gym every day. Most of those populations, whether it be in Okinawa or Sardinia or uh, Costa Rica um, um, uh, or, or the, the uh, uh, area around Loma Linda um, in California, they're just active, they're doing things. So aging immune system, it's not good, but we can't do much about it um, unless we really work at it. And as we get older, there's more inflammation, and we call that inflammaging. And there are data that we can reduce the pace of immunologic aging uh, by maintaining you know, good levels of physical activity in adulthood. And this is a paper from just a few years ago showing that people that um, uh, were uh, master cyclists um, had much better immunologic health, and then uh, 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 markers of immunologic aging were much more robust. And so, you know, keeping active into our older age, you know, by getting out and about and walking and avoid sitting in that couch all day and all night um, uh, is evidence-based. We're now in a new frontier in immunology, and that's called sleep immunology. And this is a very nice book by Ariana Huffington who found that her poor sleep habits were contributing to terrible stress and, and ill health a number of years ago. And she wrote this really great book. And there are many activities that can improve our sleep quality um, that we have access to. And that includes mindfulness meditation, um, uh, 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 cognitive behavioral therapy, all of this can be found online, and we, we focus on this in our monograph. Um, how bad is sleep deprivation in the COVID-19 era? I have it, and uh, it's pretty bad uh, as a population. Our sleep department here is one of the most overbooked. You have to wait for a long, long time to get a sleep appointment because of the uh, effects of the pandemic on our health. You don't have to be a statistician to, to understand this graph. These are uh, people uh, starting out here. This is overall survivability. Um, this is people that sleep good and green. These are people that sleep kind of bad. And these are people that sleep really bad who have insomnia. And as you can see, the rate of cumulative survival is uh, highly correlated. That's just as important as man managing your cholesterol or, or other features. Uh, sleep deprivation, this is a very fancy way of saying no inflammation and inflammation. And this is uh, what happens when you put a person in the sleep lab and you stop them from being able to fall asleep. Um, this has been shown in patients with inflammatory arthritis, rheumatoid, hasn't been studied in SPA, is that when you do this to the patients in the laboratory, within three or four days, their CRPs rise and their arthritis pain increases. And if you have arthritis, you know that the morning hours getting up is the toughest time of day. So getting that restful sleep is very, very, very important. Final stanza before we get back to talk about how to get this done is that stress, and that is a societal stress and then an individual stress. And over the COVID pandemic, uh, 
uh, both anxiety and depression and sleeplessness have only risen in our population. This impacts our immune system. But there's good news. And this starts with my mantra. And I tell every one of my patients this, is that your brain and your immune system are one organ. They're not two. The immune system is the seventh sense of the brain. And when our brain is working good, our immune system is, is augmented and strengthened. And when our brain is stressed and depressed and lonely, uh, when our PTSD or any uh, uh, of those issues, it drags our immune system down and creates inflammation. So all of this is connected. But the good news is that there is a growing science of brain and immune health. <clears throat> and there are things that we can do that not only make us feel better or well, but actually can tame down that flame of inflammation induced by um, these psychosocial changes. And I classify them into uh, top down, working with our brain, mindfulness meditation. I'll say a few words about that. Or working from the bottom up with exercises, whether it be yoga, tai chi, um, um, or qigong. Um, finally, there are other things in this world that can uh, soothe our brain and our immune system. And this is one of my favorite, and that is nature walking. And in, um, um, in Japan, that is called Shinrin Yoku, um, or forest bathing. And there's a growing um, a body of data on immune health from this. So when we actually study this experimentally, and I'm not trying to um, uh, overpower you with immunologic data, but people who meditate have decreased inflammation, strengthened T cell responses, and slowered biologic aging of the immune system. Um, uh, it is uh, 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 salutogenic, you know, favors health for the immune system. But we're trying to find out right now, how much do you need and how do you do it? Um, this is one of the most famous studies uh, of uh, early immune studies. This was done by the late Dr. Herbert Benson of the Benson Institute at Harvard. And this is this is genes. These are healthy people. These are are are, are people that are are changing uh, uh, that don't meditate. And these are master meditators, people that have done this for their whole lives. And you take a person who doesn't meditate and you just teach them after eight weeks. And now this looks more like this. And that shows you know those genes you're given at birth. This is how you're playing those cards. So even eight weeks of training of mindfulness meditation, which can be done online. And I do an app called Stress Free Now, which is free, um, uh, uh, can, can get you on the road. But there are other things that I'm so much more interested in right now. And I'm trying to design programs for uh, all types of arthritis and immunologic diseases based upon these mind-body exercises. Much work has been done in Tai Chi, and uh, um, a growing body of work is done in Qigong. These are both mind-body techniques. They include mindfulness, breathing, and movement. And movement is the one thing that I think uh, offers uh, the most for us for our vitality. It, it gets us uh, toward a, a higher degree of fitness, and um, work done at the Osher Institute at Harvard shows that moving the body strengthens the brain. And uh, 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 I do these exercises daily. Um, you can do them seating. Qigong can be done uh, with gentle movements um, in a seated position, rising and falling, combining with your breath, or you can get up and do it um, in a very physically demanding way. When I work with my patients on wellness, I actually do it with them in the office, um, and they know that I believe in this. There has been a lot of work on Tai Chi, which is a kind of a cousin of Qigong, and it can be done in 
uh, very forgiving forms for people with arthritis as well. All of these can, by the way. Don't say, I can't do this because I have spondyloarthritis. It can all be modified. This is a, a, a great book. It's older. Peter Wayne um, uh, is the head um, uh, of the Osher Institute at Harvard and has demonstrated through experimentation that uh, these type of programs can reduce fatigue, increase mental uh, alertness, um, improve our bone density, reduce pain, reduce our risk for chronic diseases, all of the above. This is the New England Journal of Medicine, the leading journal in the world, showing that a randomized controlled trial of Tai Chi can reduce the signs and symptoms of fibromyalgia. Um, and um, uh, this also has been uh, shown uh, to be um, uh, effective in other conditions and, and uh, some ev growing evidence in spondyloarthritis. I just showed this to you uh, because it's, uh, it, this is evidence. This is an opinion. Um, very, very important. Um, a form of Qigong has recently been studied in ankylosing spondylitis and uh, appeared to improve AS symptoms. This is called Watan Jin. Um, and uh, this is one of my favorites. I'm usually done standing. And we, you combine our breath. It's the beginning of the eight brocades. Um, all of this is something that is an adjunct to the great care that you should be getting for your spa. Um, can be improving your immunologic wellness. These are just some pictures of some of these movements um, uh, in the eight brocades. And every one of these can be done in a seated position. Uh, and um, um, I love this uh, because it is the beginning of that journey of a thousand miles with one step. So finally, you can keep an eye out for this. This is called immune strength. This is a way that we are gonna be teaching our patients uh, how to uh, do this uh, with an online uh, program uh, with a coach that can come to you over your phone or your computer and keep you on track, eating healthy, exercising, trying to improve your sleep and decrease your strength. Uh, we're now testing this in 100 patients with psoriatic arthritis, some of which will have spondyloarthritis we hope to have some results next year and be able to distribute this more widely if it's working the way that we hope to. Finally, this monogram that we have, uh, monograph we have um, on uh, uh, maintaining a healthy immune system with all these tips will be made available for you uh, to download uh, as a PDF. Give it to all your friends. Um, uh, it's free. Uh, we've given it to thousands of rheumatologists across the country. And now I look forward to engaging with all of you um, in a good discussion about what wellness can mean to you and how you can get it. So thank you very much. Great, thanks. We're gonna get together with um, all the panelists now. So I have Brandon and Brian, our two patient panelists, and I have uh, Dr. Calabrese and myself um, who are uh, rheumatologist, and we want to take on your questions. So we got a lot, so I'm, not, I'm gonna dive right in. I'm gonna take the first one just to allow the panelists some time to think, but I think this first question is great. It's a, what if I have multiple types of different arthritis as well as fibromyalgia? So I think this is really important to note. So just because you're diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis or psoriatic arthritis, doesn't necessarily mean that that is all that you have, right? And I think that's sometimes what makes it a little confusing when you're getting treated because your physician that you see on that day might be really focused on your psoriatic arthritis and treating that and maybe not really understanding that osteoarthritis can sometimes um, play a role, right? You can lose joint cartilage and you could have overuse syndromes that could cause osteoarthritis in addition to your psoriatic arthritis, for example. And you can also have fibromyalgia, which is more of a pain, uh, chronic pain, widespread pain condition. And the reason that this is important to note is that the treatments for these arthritis or fibromyalgia are different. 
So the more that we're able to detail out the type of joint pain you're having and how much might be related to the inflammatory component or the AS or psoriatic part versus the non-inflammatory components, such as maybe a previous injury, osteoarthritis, fibromyalgia, is important because the more we understand the different types of arthritis you might have, then we can you know, maybe treat you with more than one type of medication or recommend more than one type of path um, to get you back um, functioning the way that you want to. So I think really important question. So I'm glad that um, Andrea asked that question. So the next one, and I have so many, I'm going to start with Brandon because this was specifically for you. And I think a lot of people have probably have this on their mind. And that's about how do you know when you're pushing yourself physically? How do you know when you should pull back a little? What, what, what kind of techniques do you have? What do you listen to in your body? How can you tell somebody, you know, we're always telling you, let's exercise, let's exercise. But then, you know, there's a point where, you know, you have to balance that with, you know, injury or overuse. Uh, that is, that's a good question. And um, for the, the people listening, and maybe following along and seeing what I'm doing, I, I want everyone to know that I started very, very small very, uh, years ago after I was diagnosed. Um, I, I don't say that I had to learn how to walk again. I just had to learn how to move through this pain. And so there, there was a time when walking on a treadmill for 10 minutes was the most I could manage. And um I just decided that I was going to um, make it kind of my life's work to stay one step ahead of this disease. And so I just, um, I went out and if I was really hurting, I would see kind of, okay, I can, I can walk three miles. If I'm in this much pain, I can ride my bike 12 miles if I'm in this much pain. And so I had these kind of little benchmarks that I would set for myself and if I was in more pain than I was used to, I wouldn't do as much. Um, and then probably a couple of years ago, I mean, I mean, I spent years kind of building and building and building up to where I could like walk a half marathon or, or ride my bike 30 miles. And then um, I kind of had this revelation um, that, you know, no matter what I do, I'm going to hurt to some extent, right? Probably for the duration of my life. And so I just started walking and running and I would walk a quarter mile and I would run a quarter mile for two miles. And I did that for months. And then I would run just four miles and I just, everything has just been gone up. I haven't, I don't just jump into this. And and I also take um, at least like one very easy week a month where I may not run at all. Um, I'll just swim. There's zero impact. Um, I'll just cycle. There's zero impact. Um, and I also, I stretch like religiously every night for at least an hour. Um, I take a bath. Um, there's a lot of things I do like behind the scenes to kind of, take care of my body. So I'm ready for the next day. But I also like, if I can't walk, I don't try and like push myself to go out there. Um, so I will rest, but I also live with a mentality of if I can move, I will be out there. So, and that's just a personal choice. I don't want to urge people to go hurt themselves. I just, um, that's how I deal with this disease on a personal level. So. All right. That's great. Thank you. So Brian um, and uh, Dr. Calabrese, there seems to be some specific questions about what medications you both are on. So I'd like to redirect that only because I think it's more helpful. Maybe Brian, could you talk a little bit about, you know, maybe when you started a, a medication and what it was like, and if you had any side effects and how you dealt with that? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned that um, you know, I had psoriasis first, plaque psoriasis, and I had that in my 20s, and it was severe. It was over most of my body. Um, you know, it wasn't attractive. It was painful. It itched. It was it was a bad situation. I I refused to take any 
either oral or systemic injection type medication for a long time because I watched my dad go through some of that a long time ago when, when medications weren't as advanced as they are now. And he did have a lot of significant side effects that I didn't want any part of. So I resisted and I resisted until the, the psoriatic arthritis showed itself um, and my quality of life changed. So it was a hard decision for me to decide to go on medication and I went on biologics, um, but I did it. I have had, to my knowledge, zero side effects. Um, I was fortunate to be on the same biologic for over 10 years, which is somewhat unusual for a lot of patients. You typically have to change before that. I have recently just now changed just because of the, some of the waning effects that I was starting to see, not with my psoriatic arthritis, but with the psoriasis. And so I'm on my second biologic now, again, with, with no side effects. So other than just the hassles of the warnings of the drugs, you know, potentially lowering your immune system, um, having to take a TB test every year, having to go get blood work every three year to six months, depending on how long you've been on the medication. Um, just a lot of nuisances like that, but I feel, I feel fine. I feel healthy. I don't feel like I've become sick any more often than before I was on biologics. Um, I, I don't get sick very often at all, fortunately. So as far as any side effects of being on the medications, I've, I've seen absolutely none to my knowledge. Um, and again, I've just, that didn't, it didn't make everything go away. I still hurt every day. I'm in pain, um, but it's manageable. And, you know, as we've talked about, and Dr. Calabrese went through a great presentation of, of a lot of the things that a lot of us do is, is go through the lifestyle changes to make, to make up for some of those deficits that maybe the medicine doesn't take care of. And as I mentioned, my hope is to someday be able to manage my disease with just natural remedies and not have to be on medicine anymore. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Calabrese, there's been um, some great questions around um, the risk to your children. So if you have non-radiographic uh, spondylarthritis and how do you sort of talk to patients that are diagnosed and they worry about family members um, and, you know, we all know that having the HLA-B27 gene, it's pretty challenging research out there because the epidemiology is, you know, sort of very varied between subgroups. Um, what are some of your thoughts around? You know, I, I, the, as I say, the, the genes are what you're, you know, you're dealt with at birth. And you may carry susceptibility genes that are very strong, like B27, or you may carry susceptibility genes um, which are not strong because, you know, the, there are a lot of people that have this that are B27 negative. Regardless of that, we have lessons, not so much from the spa literature, which is rather small, but from the RA literature. You know, if you have, well, you know, one person in the family, if you have identical twins um, that carry the same identical genes across the board, that doesn't mean that the other twin is always going to get the same disease. <clears throat> In fact, discordance is very high. So we make the point that, you know, starting early with healthy life, you know, I, I feel bad for people that have gained a lot of weight in childhood. It becomes extraordinarily difficult to manage in adulthood. Um, you know, not overlooking uh, stress and social isolation and certainly, you know, creating a, 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 an activity uh, habit, um, you know, that it, at least it, it, in the sweet spot is, you know, moderate uh, physical activity, doing extra and, and being an elite athlete is great, but you don't have to do that to achieve immunologic wellness um, and, and paying attention to all these things. So, you know, when I see people who come because they have a first degree family member, we put them on this immune wellness a strategy and we get them to work with our integrative doctors who have programs that will do this. Uh, that's what you do. Great. So before I go back to um, Brandon and Brian, um, Len, I just wanted to ask you really quickly because there's a great question about sleep and, you know, sometimes it's really difficult to get a good night's sleep with these chronic pain. Should I take a sleeping med? Should I, how, how, how do you go about counseling somebody who's having poor sleep? You know, I, I, I don't have a soundbite answer for that because sleep is complicated. You know, is it difficulty falling asleep? Is it early morning awakening? Is it because you're awakening in pain? 
which is so common in spondyloarthritis. To me, that's a sign that the disease is uncontrolled and you really need the up the ante on therapy. You know, people that have uh, spinal pain, axial pain um, that is suppressed often immediately transform their sleep to begin with. So that's a warning sign for me. You know, and I, I just, I'm going to add this just as one point. And I hear um, uh, Brian and Brandon and, and myself, you know, you wish to take no medicines, but, you know, you should be very cautious not to wind up being your own worst enemy for this. I wish, I wish that when I was in my twenties and this was really bad, that there were biologics. Uh, I, I, I think it would have transformed my life. I was fortunate that mine pretty much burned out uh, over uh, the decades, but you know, uh, these medicines can be given with an excellent uh, benefit to risk profile taken by a knowledgeable patient and a concerned practitioner. Um, once pain is controlled and that helps reduce fatigue by itself, um, often adopting these wellness behaviors becomes even easier. So, you know, uh, yeah, that's aspiration, but, uh, you know, don't, don't under treat yourself. Yeah. Great, great, great message. Um, there's been a lot about uh, questions around having chronic pain, chronic disease causing stress and how do you, you know, find ways to reduce stress from pain. So Brandon and Brian, could you just give us your sound, sound bite, maybe some, some teaser, something people in the audience can go home with. How, how do you reduce stress from pain? Brandon? Um, so I have found that taking a bath um, is very helpful. Um, and I mean, I'll be real honest. I take a bath every single night. It's become um, kind of yeah. like a just a thing in our house. You know, I take a bath. My, my wife takes a bath. Sometimes our son takes a bath. It's just a very, it's like getting ready to sleep type thing. And over the years, it, it, like if we don't have that part of our routine, then like it's just something feels off. So I found that like a very hot bath is very helpful, especially if um, like my activity level for that day has been really high. Um, and I also, um, I am a huge advocate of like a daily meditation, um, at least 30 minutes, like for me, cause, um, I don't sleep very much, uh, right now, it, not like related to my d disease, but kind of the journey I'm on. That's, an, that's another thing. Um, but if I don't get 30 to, you know, 60 minutes of a, a daily meditation, then wow. I, I have a rough day. Um, and I always do a guided meditation off of YouTube. I did one today for 30 minutes and that has really changed, um, cool. you know, my, my life, I think, uh, I, I'm a huge believer in it. Um, and if you can find the time, definitely try that and just shoot for like 12 minutes, 15 minutes, and then start to go longer and, um, do it guided. That's what I would recommend. So those are my two like big go to. Excellent. Ryan. I think for me, it's, it's mostly activity. So, you know, playing hockey, running, doing, doing things that are active around the house, even get up and going for a walk, whatever that might be. I think that's how I, I relieve stress most of the time. And I saw in the chat, there was questions on well, how do you relieve stress if you have chronic pain? And sometimes that's a challenge because you're hurting, but you, I, I, I choose to still go play my hockey game in pain. I choose to still go run in pain. That's how I get through it. And it nine times out of 10 always makes me feel better. Um, I give you a perfect example. Like I'm training for a race right now, not an ultra marathon like Brandon. I'm doing a 5k. I ran today, midday, just to get out and stop work for a while. Ran my first mile in a great time. Second mile, third mile, I started to flare in my toes. And that happens sometimes. And it just went downhill from there. So, but I finished my walk, walked around the neighborhood a little bit, felt good, came back, went away. And when I went on about my day, so uh, I do some other things too. You know, I, I fiddle around on my guitar. I draw, I mess around in the garage, yes. just anything to get your mind off of the things that stress you out. My kids are a big part of that. I, I love to spend time with my kids and my family. Um, that releases my stress too. So those, those are the things I do. And Dr. Calabrese, you know, spent a lot of time talking about diet. And I think for me, I, I mentioned I've 
changed my diet a lot, but some advice I would give to you is don't let diet stress you out. Because for me, for a long time, I was trying to be so strict on a diet and that gave me more stress than anything else. So I like Dr. Calderese's BB6 um, method. And, you know, I call myself gluten conscious because I didn't totally cut out gluten. I still like drinking a beer once in a while. Um, so I just make good decisions most of the time. And that's a lot less stressful for me than trying to stick to just a super strict diet. Can I add just something here at the end that, and, and I, these guys are awesome. Uh, and I, I hope that uh, people who are watching this um, uh, uh, appreciate how much effort they have put into their own personal wellness. And I, I don't want anybody to become frightened of that, that, you know, these guys are high level athletes and, and, and doing super things. All wellness and all illness, as I said in my, my, my talk, is very personal. And, you know, what's stressful to you may not be stressful to Brandon or Brian or, or myself. And what's stressful to me may not be stressful to you. And so, you know, it, the journey of a thousand miles, you know, takes a lot of twists and turns. So, you know, you, you pick the low hanging fruit. You know, if you're the worst thing you're doing is being sedentary, you know, you start doing that instant recess. If you have a really, you know, crummy diet, um, you just start cleaning up, you know, one meal a day or have a meatless Monday or something. It, 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 it doesn't all come at once. And uh, stress, uh, uh, Brandon, uh, I can't tell you how much uh, um, I, I love your mindfulness meditation, but either some type of top down mindfulness technique, or just get involved in some type of mind body technique, um, which serves both purposes, um, and do it a, a little bit at a time. Yes, I love these um, real world examples is one of the last questions that I saw. I think this is really what resonates with us. I know we're getting close to the hour. I'm going to squeeze in one quick kind of sciencey question to Dr. Calgary, because this comes up a lot. There's a question on just peri periodic antibiotics have any role to decreasing symptoms? Um, but it has a lot of role of trashing your microbiome. <laughs> so, yeah, so we, I don't. Antibiotics yeah. are the greatest gift of the 20th century, but um, um, uh, need to be used uh, very judiciously. Thank you. Yeah, I just thought that was an interesting question. Just wanted Yes, to uh, I know where it's coming from, too. Yes, great. So uh, I know we're getting close to the hour. Uh, I would like to see if the panelists have any final uh, words before I have some closing slides. Uh, but I wanted oh. to thank uh, for all the great questions that we're having. Very privileged to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you as well. And, and as Dr. Calabri said, it's, it's, this didn't happen with Brandon and I overnight. It's been a process for us to figure out what works for us for a long time. And so everybody's different. Do what works for you. Excellent. Brandon? Uh, yeah, I, I got to agree with that. I mean, um, you, you know, it just a lot of trial and error and um, don't sell yourself short. You know, we are capable of living a very big life. Um, it just it's going to look a little different than you think. And it's going to take uh, a, a little bit more effort. But I think our ability to um, suffer is, is unmatched and we can move through anything that we put our minds to, um, it, we just have to put forth the effort. Um, and I, I also want to say, cause I, I, I think there's some, I've been getting like messages on Instagram and stuff. If, if people want to follow my journey on Instagram, you can as, uh, do as is. And I'm also raising money that goes directly to spondylitis, um, for this uh, run I'm doing. And I just want to thank you guys for having me on. And I, I hope that the listeners can just take away you know, one thing, just, you know, just change one thing at a time. Um, like pick the low hanging fruit, you know, if, if it's, uh, I'm, I'm going to walk today or I'm going to stop eating cheese. I'm going to get little, rid of a little dairy, you know, just change one thing at a time, make it easy on yourself. Do that for a while, change another thing, but don't ever sell yourself short. And right. if you're interested in the uh, immunology of wellness, follow me on Twitter, L Calabrese, easy to find. L Calabrese, excellent. We have all these social media 
minds. This is great. So thank you um, all for your attention and, and especially for the panelists for their candor. And hopefully this inspires you to not only have a conversation with your family around wellness and your disease, but also with your physician um, and, and things that they uh, may direct you to or help you do as well. We want to make this mainstream. We want to make this question about what are you doing for your wellness today as mainstream as how you're doing on your medications. Um, so, so thank you, everyone. Um, next slide, please. Just to remind um, everyone um, that uh, please let us know how we did. Uh, we love the feedback. Um, your feedback is really important to us. Um, thank you for spending the evening with us and please visit us on here or scan the QR code um, to let us know how we did or what else you wanna know. Um, and next slide, please. Just as a reminder, this is um, the, uh, check out our podcast, uh, has some more tidbits that I did with Brandon and Brian. We had a lot of fun doing this. Um, it goes into a little deeper dive um, about lifestyle habits. Next slide. And last but not least, um, we are CAPES uh, webinar. We are the number four or the final episode. But if you want to go back and listen to um, the other episodes, please visit on capes.org. Um, or from meta.com uh, slash login. And you can see that there are four other, three other series that you could see in addition um, to the one that you joined with us today. Next slide. So thanks a lot for your attention and a big thank you for Brandon and Brian for, uh, you know, really staying on this evening and uh, really being uh, so informative and inspiring. <laughs>